I'm Jonathan Leventhal. It's a privilege to be here to talk to you today about melanoma. I'm going to focus on diagnosis, risk factors, what predisposes you to getting melanoma, and screening. <clears throat> I wanted to start by a few key facts. So skin cancer is the most common cancer in the United States. Approximately one out of five people will develop it. And basal cell is the one that's most frequent, followed by squamous cell and melanoma. Now, even though melanoma accounts for approximately 1% of all skin cancers, it is the deadliest and nearly over a million people live with it in this country, and every hour one American dies. And so what is melanoma? It's a, it's a cancer of the melanocytes. So these are the cells that produce pigment, and they're predominantly located in the skin, but they can also occur in other mucosal areas, such as the eyes, mouth, and gastrointestinal tracts. Most cases arise on otherwise normal skin, but there are cases that can occur um, from a mole, a birthmark, or an atypical mole that transforms. And so who develops melanoma? I'm gonna talk more about this with risk factors, but really melanoma is a disease that anybody can get, the young and the old. The majority of people with melanoma are white men over age 50. However, if you look at epidemiologic studies under age 50, actually the number of women with melanoma is, is higher than that of men, likely due to tanning habits. But by age 50, that of uh, men doubles that of women. And so this is a slide that Dr. Arian always loves to show, which shows that the lifetime risk of melanoma in the United States has really increased dramatically since World War II. And this is likely due to many reasons, which I'm not going to get into, but likely a result of increased ultraviolet radiation and that we've gotten better at diagnosing melanoma and picking up um, thinner tumors, which is actually good news. And so we'll start by diagnosis. So how do we make the diagnosis of melanoma? So the first step is to identify a concerning lesion. And so I just wanted to show you briefly what melanomas typically look like. And so it's important to remember the A, B, C, D, E's. A for asymmetry, B for irregular borders, C for colors varied, D stands for diameter greater than a pencil tip eraser. I really don't like that one because melanomas can actually be smaller than a pencil tip eraser rarely. So dermatologists, we like D for dark because the vast majority of melanomas are actually pigmented and dark. And E is perhaps the most important one. That means evolution. The lesion is changing in some way, size, shape, color, itches, or bleeds. And so there's different types of melanoma. I won't spend too long on this. Superficial spreading is the most common, followed by nodular, which tend to grow like a nodule deeper into the skin. Then there's lentigo maligna in areas of chronic sun exposure. Then there's amelanotic, which can be very difficult to diagnose. These melanomas are not pigmented. They can be pink or red and can be very tough to diagnose and often present later on. Then there's acral melanomas, which can occur on the hands, feet, or under the nails. And so once you've identified a concerning lesion, a uh, physician, dermatologist, surgeon, or others performs a skin biopsy, either a shave, a punch, or an excisional. And the final step is the pathologist looks at it under the microscope and is able to identify the melanoma cells and makes the diagnosis. And the pathologist provides other important information, such as the depth, how deep does it extend into the skin. And that is very important prognostic information. And so next we'll talk about the risk factors. So there's two types of risk factors, those that you can control in your environment and those that you can control that are hereditary. So first we'll focus on the modifiable risk factors. And so ultraviolet radiation is really the primary risk factor for melanoma. Sunburn fades, but sun damage lasts. And that's important to remember. So ultraviolet radiation or UV radiation, these are rays that are emitted from the sun. And there's three main types. Ultraviolet C is pretty much blocked by the ozone, but ultraviolet A and B um, hit the skin and can extend into the skin. And what happens is that over time, they cause changes in our DNA, damages known as mutations. And as they accumulate, that's how skin cancers can develop. It's also important to remember that ultraviolet A can actually penetrate the car window. And I always tell that to my patients. And so we know that unfortunately, the type of sun exposure that's most associated with melanoma is the type that we love the most. That short intermittent bursts, playing golf, tennis, beach vacations. And a majority of melanomas can be attributed to ultraviolet exposure and occur in areas of our skin that are intermittently exposed to the sun. And so we have evidence that the number of sunburns that you have throughout life increases your odds of getting melanoma. In fact, having five blistering sunburns in childhood increases your risk 80%. But a lot of my patients feel that, well, I had a lot of sunburns in childhood, so I'm screwed. I might as well enjoy the sun now. And I try to tell them that's not the case. We actually know that a lot of the sun damage can actually occur in adulthood as well, tennis players, golfers. And we, here's the evidence right here. It's cumulative number of sunburns throughout life. And so you can always limit the damage. 
We also know that tanning beds are associated with melanoma. And this is really important for young women in particular who, who over the years have been more prone to go and, 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 and do tanning beds. I think they should all be equipped with this uh, selection before you enter it. And so studies have shown that young women who have reported tanning have an increased odds of getting melanoma. I get this question a lot about spray tanning. Is it okay? And it is safe. Spray tanning safe. You just don't want to overdo it like uh, Ross did in Friends. So, so, so flying through, the next, um, the next thing I wanted to talk about are risk factors that we really can control, the ones that we uh, inherit, the hereditary factors. And so probably the most important one here is nevi. That's number of moles. So studies have shown that the more moles you have, anywhere from over 50 to 100, increases your risk of getting melanoma. We also know that having atypical appearing moles, these sort of dysplastic moles, we call them, can also increase your risk. And having sunspots develop over the years as a sign of sun exposure to the skin is also associated. We also know that having fair skin, red hair, light eyes, blue eyes, freckles, all increases your risk of melanoma. And this is because the melanocyte density is lower in these individuals. And so the melanocytes, which protect you from ultraviolet damage, um, is, isn't present as in, in dense amounts as those who have darker skin, darker hair. And so the risk of melanoma is, is um, much increased. We know that having a personal history increases your risk of getting other skin cancers. And for better or for worse, you can't pick your family. And we know that having a mother, father, sister, brother, or child with melanoma doubles your risk as well. So these are important to consider with regards to who, who might um, benefit from screening for melanoma. And I, just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but the main point here is that there are genes that are passed on through families that can increase the risk of melanoma. And some of these syndromes run together with other, other cancers like pancreatic cancer and melanoma. And so there's a strong, very strong family history, for instance, of pancreatic cancer and melanoma in your family, you want to tell your doctor because you can do genetic screening. And so the last part of the talk is about screening. So how do we screen for skin cancers and what are the guidelines? And so unfortunately, we don't have national guidelines about screening for skin cancer. In fact, the United States Preventative Services Task Force said that there's really not great evidence for primary care doctors to screen people. Now, this is really important because this does not apply to anybody who's at risk for developing melanoma, okay? So what the recommendations are is to, is to educate young children, especially who are at increased risk of burning to protect themselves from the sun. And dermatologists, what our recommendations are is for those with a history of skin cancer or a strong family history to see dermatologists. And if you've had melanoma, usually twice yearly. And the most important line here is the last one. Anyone who has um, a new concerning skin lesion should absolutely see a dermatologist. And so we know that dermatologists are able to find melanomas that are thinner and therefore less aggressive before they become thicker. We also know that if you can teach patients and their partners what to look for, that they can do a really good job at finding melanomas as well. And this is a recent uh, paper that came out a couple years ago um, showing this. And so I already discussed what you're looking for. I always tell my patients, look for the ugly duckling. So if you have a lot of moles on your body, they all kind of look similar. There's a signature mole, we call it the signature nevus, but the melanomas often look different and they're not always difficult to find. And dermatologists can use special magnifying glasses, which you may have seniors use, called a dermatoscope, which magnifies the pigment, which can really help distinguish a melanoma from another mole. And dermatologists might also photograph um, anything that's concerning to watch it over time. And so I'll finish my talk by just reviewing how to screen yourself. And there's nothing like a video to demonstrate this. So what the cat's demonstrating here is that it's really important to look everywhere on the skin. It's important to look through the hair because skin cancer can happen in the hair. You always want to look anywhere that's a skin fold, like under the breasts, on the armpits, even the genital areas. And you want to make sure your dermatologist is doing this. And if they're not, you want to make sure you see someone who's really going to do a thorough comprehensive skin exam for you. And so now that you've seen how to conduct a skin exam, I'll take questions. Thank you.